Hello, good evening to you and welcome to News 360. It's coming to you live from our news hub here at Disaway Kanda. I'm Natalie Foyt. And my name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up in the bulletin tonight. Economic and Organized Crime Office indicts former SNIT boss Ernest Thompson and four others for willfully causing financial loss to the state. Auditor General Daniel Yao Domelovo calls for review of Internal Audit Act to avert intimidation and threats of arbitrary transfers. Also ahead this evening, United Nations human rights expert asks government to focus on redistribution of wealth. And in business this evening, World Bank cautions African governments to pay more attention to rising public debts. And on the foreign front tonight, Zimbabwe's government sacks more than 10,000 nurses who went on strike on Monday. We've got the details of these stories for you right here on News 360, including news from the world of entertainment and sports. As always, this bulletin is streaming live all across the world on freenews.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. You can also watch us on DSTV Channel 279. Let's get started with our very first story this evening. The Auditor General, Daniel Yao Domelovo, has called for a review of the Internal Audit Act to make auditors staff of the Central Internal Audit Unit. Speaking at the 2018 Annual Internal Audit and Governance Conference in Accra, he argued the move would avert intimidation and threats of arbitrary transfers. Daniel Yao Domelovo noted that for an internal auditor to be functional, Practitioners ought to be independent in the discharge of their duties, devoid of intimidation and threat of transfer by management calling for a relook at the Internal Audit Act. A bad management will say, my friend, go and change this. You can't put this on record. If you don't do this, <laughs> you are moving you from Accra to wherever you don't want to go. And human beings as they are, they may decide to look at their personal interests and say, okay, sir, I will change it. That's why I'm calling for the review of the Internal Audit Act to make all the staff of internal auditor, uh, the internal auditors in the public sector staff of that agency so that that independence can be established. He urged internal auditors who are being intimidated to remain professional and be bold in the discharge of their duties. So be professional in the discharge of your work. If you write a report you are asked to edit, especially those of you in the public sector, Agree to the editing so that you are not transferred. But send me a copy of the original one. Give me a blind copy. Just give me a blind copy of the original one, and we will not refer to you at all. These days, the ministries will tell you we are doing a lot of special audit. They don't know where it's coming from. When we get that information, we set up a team. We go and do a special audit and we zoom into the area to find out whether it is true. If it is true, we take it up. Fortunately, we cannot be transferred. A member of the Public Account Committee, an MP for Gumua West, Alexander Aban, was outraged at some infractions cited in the Auditor General's report, casting doubt on the efficiency of some internal auditors in public institutions. Does the internal auditor have the power to disallow a transaction and even cause a surcharge on the procurement officer or other relevant person for such suspicious transactions? I think that the attitude of leadership in the various public institutions is what will determine the future growth or deterioration or decline in the fortunes of that institution. Acting Director General of the Internal Audit Agency, Ransford J, stressed the need for the acquisition of knowledge, skills and other competences and called on internal auditors to arm themselves with professional certification and qualification. Another important thing is non-implementation of internal auditors' recommendations. This is also a major concern to the agency. With all the research, with all the commitment, 
the effort, the energy spent on this. If the internal auditor comes out with recommendations and are not implemented, it becomes a demotivating to the internal auditor. And you can imagine, the next time, she will not be able to bring to you your attention key issues. The conference was organized by the Institute of Internal Auditors Ghana, IAA, and was under the theme, Impact of Leadership on Institutional Governance. And now the Economic and Organized Crime Office, EOCO, has indicted former SNED boss NS Thompson and four others for willfully causing financial loss to the state over the procurement of the $72 million IT software. Board Chairman of SNED, Dr. Kwame Adokofo, made this known at a news conference in Accra. The news conference was to officially take delivery of the report conducted by the PricewaterhouseCoopers on the pages of the IT software. It was to cover a period of three years. The team which conducted the review of SNAIT also focused on the reasons for purchasing an IT software. Some of the findings suggested that the $72 million used to purchase the IT software was overbloated. It indicated that the amount should have rather been less than $4 million. Currently, Yoko has cited four top management of staff, including the OB company, which supplied the software. The investigative body has since directed those implicated to the Attorney General for further probe. The original OBS contract sum was $34.0 million US dollars. But at the time the project was completed, the contract sum had shot up to $66.8 million US dollars and 36 million Ghana cedars. This means that at the end of the OBS project, an additional amount of 32 million US dollars and 36 million Ghana cedars was paid to PBS. Five suspects were arrested, and they are Ernest Thompson, former Director General of SNET, Mrs. Juliet Hassan Akrama, CEO, PBS, John Hagan Mensa, former OBS project manager, Caleb Kweku Afaglu, and Thomas Samson Ousu. However, four of them have been cautioned. These include Ernest Thompson, Mrs. Juliet Hassan Akrama, John Hagan Mensa, and Caleb Kwaku Afaglu. After investigations, the office preferred charges of willfully causing financial loss to the state. Director General of Senate, Dr. Jotin Krain, explained that other payments on the purchase of the IT software have been suspended. Costs and a lot of bills that were scheduled to be paid, we didn't pay them yet. We decided that we should all be vetted and, if possible, renegotiated. And we've succeeded in doing some of that. But Chairman Dr. Adokufo pledged strong commitment to uphold the integrity of SNIT to improve benefits of contributors. We are not pushing anything under the carpet. But so far as criminal activity is concerned, Yoko has already dealt with that. So you have nothing to worry about. Management and the board have assured pensioners of improved earnings in the coming months. Meanwhile, SNIT has implored the controller and accountant general to remove 7,844 ghost names from its payroll. This, according to SNIT, has saved the country an amount of 3.56 million CDs. Director General of SNIT, George Tenkran, spoke at a news conference in Accra. The 7,844 names for the past three years have remained on the payroll of SNIT as contributors. The names were, however, non existent after investigations conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers. The Controller Accountant General has been asked by the management of SNET to delete the ghost names. About 7,844 pensioners who are presumed not to be living, and that is saving us an amount of 3.56 million Ghana cities a month, shaving it off the payroll. Now, if any of these pensioners that we have de deactivated resurrect, meaning that maybe they were not able to come and re-authenticate themselves, then we have this money in escrow and we can make them whole again. To further report confidence in Senate, management said it has cut down on its overhead and administrative costs. 
The Director General, Dr. George Tengkrain, says he has cut down on traveling, which initially cost 7.4 million cities to 1.9 million cities a year. He stated that the trust has halted the purchases of some items since 2017. In 2016, for example, we found out that uh, Christmas hampers alone cost this trust close to a million Ghana cities. 2017, the board and management decided no hampers. So we didn't uh, procure any uh, hampers. Of major concern to management of Senate is an amount of 19 million cities which had been lost through non-prudent investment. Our management accounts from last year, 2017, compared to 2016, show that in 2016, the total of the fund lost value to the tune of about 18 to 19 million Ghana cities. In 2017, our management accounts show that we added about 900, 978 million Ghana cities to the fund. Management has agreed to properly review the operations of SNIT to improve benefits of contributors. Now, it's clear to many that these developments within SNIT is calling to question the integrity of the trust. Like you saw earlier, there are even hampers being put on hold. The spending history of SNIT does not really co create that much trust in Guineans. Now, I'm going to run us by the indicted SNIT officials and these four who were called and charged for willfully causing financial loss to the state. Ernest Thompson, the former director general, main one here, Ernest Thompson, the former director general of SNIT, Juliet Kramer, the CEO of Perfect Business System, the IT company involved in this. John Hagen Mensa, the former OBS project manager of SNIT. Caleb Kweku Afaglo, the director of ICT, who, if you would recall, whose educational qualifications came to question. Thomas Samson Owusu of SNIT as well. Now, the scandal and the investigations that have been carried out so far with regards to this scandal. An independent assessment and a review of the operations of the trust in the first quarter of 2017 for a three-year period has been done. Now, the following was done to establish possible cases of financial loss being caused to SNIT, an IT review. There was an assessment of the automation project, IT governance, as well as the effectiveness of information security systems and controls following the issue with regard to the OBS system at SNIT. Now, the internal controls assessment, the assessment of the quality of the trust, financial management, the accounting and the control processes that goes on within SNIT, within the trust. Now, HR functions and effectiveness review was also put to question, looking at the talent and performance management systems, the succession planning, the existing HR policies. So this shows us that in addition to the financial issues within SNIT, there's an HR issue that was being probed as well. Independent financial review, a review of the operational cash flow and performances for the financial years of, years of 2014, 15, and 16, respectively, and a three-month period ending 31st March 2017. So this all has been done so far in terms of the investigations being carried out, but the bottom line here is that it's clear that the integrity of SNIT is really being called to question, and many Ghanaians are concerned. Alfred, on to you. All right, right. Now, Natalie, thank you. So clearly, uh, SNIT promised sometime in August 2017 when this came up that they were going to publish the details of whatever uh, uh, report or investigations into this particular scandal by PwC. Thank you. Uh, Adam Serrano is a co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. He joins me in the studio, and I'm grateful for your time this evening. Now, this was suspected. Now, there's been some more detail to it because... SNET boss indicated that these findings corroborate what Ioko put out there early on. How does all of this get to you? Well, first of all, it is uh, very important to commend the current management of SNET for having taken the steps to do the necessary reviews and assessment that give us a better picture mm -hmm. of what exactly transpired during the period. Um, to the extent that they have also collaborated what Ioko has said, that's good for us. Mm -hmm. It means that we now know that there is a case to be answered and the various individuals involved should be brought before the courts to answer and to explain what happened. Um, but we are still um, several days from knowing exactly who is culpable, etc. Because trial and, will have to begin. The trial will have to begin. <clears throat> and as we all know, sometimes these cases can take forever. And so it is important that SNET and its current management stays the course of ensuring that whoever will represent them and make sure the 
contents are uh, taken to court, investigated, and the right people held accountable. That actually happens mm -hmm. because that's what the good people of Ghana expect, mm -hmm. not just the fact that we have established that something has gone wrong. So in the end, you're saying that even though there's going to be prosecutions and all, it's causing financial loss, and the money will have to be paid back because you're talking about contributors' monies. Absolutely. That has been lost. Absolutely. Indeed, one of the things that I, I think should, probably should be a test case or a precedent mm -hmm. is this number of assessments that were done. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that maybe we ought to be doing this any time we have a change of management, mm -hmm. do assessments of what happened in the Over last the period. Yes, so that we can establish whether the various cash flow systems, financial management, HR, were you know, managed in a manner that upholds the kind of things that we expect. <laughs> You know, beyond the f financial aspects, uh, which we really we call to question in, in this report, and this is the, the summary of the report, and I must say that we're going to be serializing various aspects of this uh, executive summary of, of the investigations and subsequently. But if you look at page uh, 20 of this particular uh, executive summary report, they say we were unable, that's PWC, to determine the actual payments made by SNIT for each of the components of the automation project. This is because separate project codes were not established for accounting purposes. Payments provided to us were in respect to all transactions, and they have recommended that going forward, they would advise that separate project accounts should be maintained for each project to ensure that payments can subsequently be reconciled to contractual provisions. This is fundamental administrative structure that should be there. Now, how, how, how could this have happened? And one would say that beyond this financial loss to the state, there's had some administrative cost as well that has been seen Absolutely. in there. Absolutely. It, it brings into question the competency of the people who were put in charge of these various projects. And in my mind, uh, if we're having an auditor general uh, representative who goes there and looks through the books, this is something that between the uh, the board's role in looking at it, the subcommittees of the board and the auditor general should have been identified long ago, especially because you are uh, keeping in trust the monies that belong to contributors whose you know long-term benefits, retirement benefits are in your hands. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, strange situation we find ourselves that in such a very critical state organization, you find that people don't do the basic things that are required to guarantee the protection of the funds that belong to ordinary citizens. One other aspect of this, finally, uh, is uh, the bit about the investments that SNAIT made. That was also brought to question, you know, in a precarious nature. So you see that this particular part of the report on page 35 says, as, as per the financial accounts, investment returns fell year on year from 33.71% in 2014 to 18.12% in 2016. And they look at uh, areas that uh, SNAIT invested, Metro Mass Transit, West Hills Mall, Africa World Airlines, and, and then tr the Trust Sports Emporium. This should also attract some review. Yes, and, and, and I think that the issue of the board and the composition of the board, because there's a lot of supervis supervisory uh, deficits you find here. One is not expecting that um, on a quarterly basis, assuming the board meets and the, mm. the management led by its director general make a presentation. And this should involve charts showing what is happening in terms of investments, what has happened in terms of the, the value of what we are holding for, for people. Somebody at some stage should have said, now, what is happening that, you know, the returns to the people is going down, the value of what we have is going down. What is it that is going on? Do you have a financial analyst? Do you have somebody who's looking at what portions of the economy you're investing, what types of investments you're making? This should have come up. And so for me, this actually brings into question the quality of the board and what, what, who was part of that board? How was it composed? Did he have the kind of expertise that would enable them to interrogate these issues and ensure that the, the various contributors to SNIT were getting value for money? Zano, thank you. They say the journey has just begun, but I'm grateful for your time. Thank you, too. Sir. Thank you so much. As I'm saying, I know is the co chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. Join us studio for this. But Angela reports uh, on the poor nature of roads in the Volta region. This is the Eastern Corridor Road in the Volta region. It was started some years back, but they stopped and accidents have been occurring each and every day on this road. It's very deadly and very, very bad. 
We are calling on government. They've said this several times, promises upon promises. And even the government made mention of it in his State of Nation address. Please kindly come to our aid. Your people are dying. This is Angela reporting from the North Volta. Or you can be like Angela and also send your video report via WhatsApp number 055 We encourage you to send uh, issues of national concern and social relevance to this number. We'll be back shortly with some business news. And I come as our is standing by to stay. All right, thanks for staying with us here on News 360 Time for Business with me, Nanikia Mensa Brampa. Starting with not too much on a good note, the World Bank has cautioned African governments to pay more attention to the issue of rising public debt as it is gradually eating up fiscal stability as well as growth. And according to Chief Economist for the Africa region, Albert Zufak, the number of countries classified as having high risk of debt distress has increased from 8 in 2013 to 18 in 2018, of which Ghana is a part. According to the World Bank, public debt relative to GDP keeps rising. There was a sharp increase of more than 20 percentage points in relative signs of debt in 2013, even though some of the debt distressed countries have faster growth rates. This time around, the structure of our debt has changed significantly. It's no longer concessional debt that is leading the, the way, but countries are now issuing more market and private sector debt, countries are issuing sovereign you know, debt on markets, and this has the consequence of increasing market-related risk and threatening our debt sustainability. Higher debt burdens and the increasing exposure to market risks raise concerns about debt sustainability among African countries. An economist at the World Bank, Kwabnejan Kwache, describes Ghana's situation. The World Bank and the IMF analysis of the sustainability of Ghana's debt is, is not going to be sustainable in the near future if we don't do anything about the, the fiscal deficit now. And I've also said that uh, the fiscal de deficit now they intend to reduce. So subject to what they intend to do now, um, if they are able to achieve it, then definitely um, um, the debt to GDP level will also go down. According to Africa Pulse, a biannual analysis of the state of African economies conducted by the World Bank, African countries must focus more on managing its debts and debt policies. There has to be a focus on um, fiscal adjustment and looking at both you know consolidation on uh, in terms of uh, expenditures and on the revenue side um, a greater focus on prioritization of expenditure and within that when it comes to public investment a focus on the quality of managing uh, public investment sub-saharan growth is projected to reach 3.1 percent in 2018 to an average 3.6 percent in 2019 to 2020 the World Bank is further asking African governments to fully embrace technology and leverage innovation to ensure quality, affordability and sustainable electricity. The African Pulse report of the World Bank is also pushing African economies to improve on the regulation of the electricity sector and better management of utilities as African household electrification still remains the lowest in the world. The Bank of Ghana, in collaboration with the International Financial Corporation, is instituting measures to ensure that confidence in financial sectors is increased. Now, with what it calls financial literacy and public awareness campaign, the group is working at ensuring that access to credit for individuals as well as corporate institutions and SMEs is made simple. 
The financial literacy and awareness campaign brought together all stakeholders in the financial sector. The aim is to ensure that access to credit is made easy for individuals, corporate institutions, as well as SMEs. Head of Financial Stability Department at the Bank of Ghana, Augustin Donko, emphasized the need for small businesses to easily access credit. There are a lot of uh, financial institutions who are in the business of lending uh, credit. Interestingly, there are also a lot of uh, people, business people, various uh, categories, uh, small scale, big scale, who need this credit. But unfortunately, there are certain uh, impediments which usually prevent particularly the small scale from assessing this credit. Credit referencing is key to ensuring that small businesses do not necessarily need collateral to access credit. To basically check with the collateral industry to find out whether that particular um, asset is encumbered. If it's encumbered, you know what to do as a buyer. Lead financial sector specialist Luz Maria Salamina intimates it is working towards ensuring that SMEs do not require collateral to access loans. Some sort of asset that usually is not accepted by a bank traditionally as a collateral because usually the banks get real estate as collateral, right? So we want them to be able to use their productive assets, their machinery, their cattle, their, their, their crops as collateral. As the exercise is therefore in partnership with the Credit Referencing Bureau to ensure that persons who access loans are not their financial obligation. There should be a credit regime such that there should be some sanity within the credit market. Because as you know, when the credit market is not well regulated and when there are no, there are no safeguards within the credit market, people tend to abuse it. And we see what is happening. Financial intermediaries like banks can collapse. And when institutions like this collapse, it has a ripple effect on the whole economy. And the role we play is basically to ensure that that kind of sanity actually is maintained within the credit market. This campaign comes at a time the central banks around the world have adopted sound environmental and social practices as part of sustainable banking principles. And the Ghana Revenue Authority Wednesday stormed shops in Accra to enforce the use of excise tax stamps, warning that defaulting goods are liable to seizure. Noor Falong has more on this report. The Excise Tax Stamp Act 2013, Act 873, was passed by Parliament in December 2013 with the aim of helping the Ghana Revenue Authority enforce the affixing of excise tax stamp on specific excisable goods before they are delivered ex factory, cleared from any port or presented for sale. The Ghana Revenue Authority says the policy is necessary to stop tax evasion. Until December 31, 2018, government will share the cost of the stamps with manufacturers and importers on a 50-50 basis. The Ghana Revenue Authority's enforcement team Wednesday hit town to check on the level of compliance. The exercise, which began at the industrial area in Accra, visited Melcom, Gihok Distilleries, Maxmart and other shops where non-compliant goods were taken off the shelves and shop managers cautioned against selling unstamped goods. Communications and Public Affairs Head at the GRA, Bobi Ansa, said non-compliance will not be tolerated, warning the public against buying products without the excise tax stamp. We appeal to all manufacturers and to distributors and retailers. Now the message is that if you go out there and don't have the stamp on the product, don't buy them. The next time we are going to see the product. We also want to appeal to Ghanaians that from now, if you don't see the excise tax on the product we are talking about, don't buy them because we cannot buy for the genuineness. Some managers said they had started the process of affixing stamps, but it had stalled due to large quantities of goods to be stamped. This allows us to trace the fake ones. So if you are going to do fake, pay taxes on the fake also. Very good. So this allows us to identify fake products in the market. All our imported has been tagged. It's just left with the local suppliers, which we have a list from GRA that we should be listing them down, those that don't have a tag, which we have the list, and the quantity of items they've come. So now that they are here, we'll call the local guys to come and take their thing and stamp it. 
There's more news on tweenews.com. That will do for business tonight. My name is Nanikia Mensabra, but Alfred Okansi is standing by with more. Hmm. Nanikia, thank you for business uh, this evening. A United Nations human rights expert has called on government to focus redistribution of wealth and resources if it is serious about achieving the sustainable development goal of eradicating extreme poverty. Professor Philip Alston maintained, although Ghana has made strides in terms of democracy, its efforts at bridging the poverty gap and implementing social protection programs leave much to be desired. Professor Philip Alston was speaking at a news conference in Accra. In a report, the UN Special Rapporteur painted a bleak picture of Ghana's social protection interventions and a startling growth of inequality among its citizens. Key among findings of the report was the fact that although Ghana stands out in Africa as a champion of democracy, very little attention has been paid to programs that directly impact the lives of people living in poverty. Ghanaian politicians are maybe world champions, I think, at creating memorable slogans. But an awful lot of faith has been pinned in the ability of some of these new programs. I admire the effort to try to stimulate the economy, to bring in more private capital and so on. But these programs are not designed and will not result in improving the situation of those living in poverty. According to the report, one out of 12 Ghanaians wallows in extreme poverty. In Ghana, 40% of children are more likely to live in poverty than adults, which is a major increase from 15% in 1990. 38.2% of rural dwellers live in poverty as opposed to 10.4% in urban areas. 70 of the country's wealthiest persons own about 7% of the country's GDP, a situation which was a staggering reflection of the weak welfare interventions in the country. Professor Austin holds the view, although the Ghana Beyond Aid vision by government is admirable, the poor will be the biggest losers when foreign aid that primarily funds social protection programs ends. With social protection programs in this country, apart from the very low amount of money spent on them, is that they are also insecure. A lot of them are heavily funded by foreign donors. Ghana Beyond Aid is a very worthy objective. But as much as the government tries to tell me this doesn't mean we don't want aid. What I hear from foreign donors is that they are taking the message. The report essentially suggested some adjustments be made with regards to an effective taxation system. The elimination of illicit financial flow through corruption was also highlighted as a means of accruing revenue to pump into social protection programs. The special rapporteur's final report on his visit to Ghana will be presented to the upcoming session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva in June 2018. Now, members of parliament and other high-profile personalities, including police personnel, dominated the number of road traffic offenders cautioned by the central MTTD in a special operation on the Spintex Road. Peter Kwawadato reports the offenders were driving dangerously, facing oncoming traffic or on the shoulders of the road in a bid to avoid traffic. The driver is supposed to be on the road and not to use the shoulders of the road. So therefore, we are charging you for uh, driving on the wrong side of the road, which amounts to dangerous driving. You cause road obstruction and cause danger to other road users. What do you have to say? The Road Traffic Regulation 2012 Act 2180 barred persons from fitting on their motor vehicles, a warning appliance other than a type approved by the licensing authority. Subsection 3 of the Act lists the warning appliances as siren or bell. 
used on classified motor vehicles for government officials, the police, fire service, ambulance for hospitals and clinics, recognize government security agencies and license bullion vehicles. A person who contravenes this regulation, according to subsection 4, commits an offence and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not more than 25 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not more than 30 days or both. Ironically, it is common to see motorists abusing the road traffic regulation with careless abandon. These, according to the police, are largely to be blamed for the increasing fatalities on the road. The Wednesday morning operation was to remind motorists of the law and punish those caught flouting it. The first culprit who was driving facing oncoming traffic is a personal assistant to the Speaker of Ghana's Parliament. Next was this Member of Parliament, who demanded to be excused, but the policemen declined. What? Member of Parliament, do you have the right to drive the road? No, park here. You need the process, okay? You park here. Sir. They were followed by police officers in their private vehicles. At least more than five police personnel were cautioned at the end of the two-hour operation. Equally guilty of the same offence were commercial drivers. The second in command at the central MTTD, Superintendent Alex Kwame Jabaku Amenya, led the operation. They drive recklessly along the road and face oncoming vehicles, which poses danger to other road users. And uh, we want to ensure that uh, that uh, habit is stopped. Our aim is to enforce the uh, road traffic regulation 2180 and make sure that uh, our roads are safe for the general public. All offenders are to appear in Accra Motor Court on Thursday, April 19. Oh, clearly, nobody is above Absolutely the law. Not. You're a Sorry. member of parliament yeah. or otherwise. And Peter Kwadato is committed to this with the help yes. of the police. So stay with us. He's going to be doing a lot more of these exposés of persons in authority who are breaking the law with impunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to News 360. Now, in some news making rounds on the international front, Zimbabwe's government has sacked more than 10,000 nurses who went on strike on Monday in an attempt to quell labor unrest. Vice President Constantino Chiwenga said the nurses had refused to return to work after $17 million was released to increase their pay. The vice president chided them for not going back in the interest of saving lives. But the extraordinary move may simply be a tactic aimed at forcing the nurses back to work. Reviving the health sector has been a key challenge for President Emerson Nangagwa, who recently agreed to pay rises in order to end a doctor's strike. Government has decided in the interest of patients and of saving lives to discharge all the striking nurses with immediate effect, said Gen Chiwenga, the former army chief who led the overthrow of longtime leader Robert Mugabe in November. He said unemployment and retired nurses would be hired to replace those who had been sacked. In response, Zimbabwe's Nurses Association said it had taken note of the move, but added that the nurses remained on strike. Visit our website, 3news.com, for some more international news. Next is Entertainment News with Nana Addo. It's now time for some entertainment and lifestyle news with me, Nana Kwejuado, brought to you by Vodafone Power to you and Fanmax Fuel Your Day. Now on the back of Moesha Bidon, uh, CNN's chief international correspondent, Christiana Amampor, is unhappy with public outrage directed at Moesha Bidon for revealing the economy of Ghana forced her to sleep with married men to take care of her needs. Actress Moisha Budong, contributing to CNN's Sex and Love show, revealed the state of the Ghanaian economy has pushed her to sleep with a married man in order to survive. Are you basically telling me that you're having sex with this guy essentially to pay your rent? Because he can afford to take care of you. Moisha's comments stirred up public outrage as many believed she disgraced not only herself but all Ghanaian women. A statement signed by the gender minister Otiko Jaba slammed the actress for her statement, which painted Ghanaian women in a manner quite objectionable on the world stage. 
The statement added Moisha's revelation inaccurately portrayed the actions of millions of hardworking women who hustled dusk to dawn to survive. Moisha has subsequently apologized for her remarks, but host of the show, Christian Amampo, finds it unfortunate Moisha has become the target of public shaming by the Ghanaian press. The renowned journalist sees the bashing as an affront to the country's acclaimed free speech environment, revealing Moisha fears returning to the country safely. The host want people to recognize Moisha's right to speak up and the courage she showed by sharing such intimate details about her personal life. What does your man expect of you? He me to be loyal and just to date him only and give him sex when he wants. Yeah. And what if you said no one day? He turns up at your house and you got a headache. What does he say? You can't say no. You have to give him what he wants. Christian Amampo further encouraged Ghanaians to reserve judgment for the whole episode of the show and understand that all must be seen in context, not judged on one except. Amampo appealed to the President of Ghana and the Gender, Children and Social Protection Minister to stand up for the rights of one of their own who was simply enjoying a carefree, boisterous and mostly humorous conversation. So that particular story has got people talking, and so the president of the Ghana Actors Guild, Sam Fishion, had something to say. Her case is flawed because Moesha herself has apologized. She's remorseful. Yeah. And so why would uh, uh, the interviewer rather want to turn around and bash Ghanaians yeah. in that contest? I mean, it, it is flawed. Her arguments are flawed. In, in the very first instance, just after the interview, you, you, you did advise her yeah. to make sure that her daughter will not tell the line that she stole it. What does it mean? Why would she want to advise Moesha? Then it means that there's something negative. She sees something negative in the presentation that Moesha made. So what are you bashing Ghanaians for? So Ghanaians should have healed. Uh, for the things that you advise her against. Double standards. You're having sex with this guy essentially to pay your rent because he can afford to take care of you. Once she has apologized, then it goes to say that the interview she granted was not wholly uh, safe. So for Amampo to have been calm lashing at Ghanaians, have been, she's got it all wrong. All that I would want to say is that uh, moderation should be the word. As actors and actresses, uh, moderation should guide us. We should be guided by what we say. Because if you are not very careful, one little slip will end your career. Indeed, we have to be careful with what we say, according to Sam Fisher, and that was the president of the Ghana Actors Guild. And that's how we wrap up entertainment news right here on News 360. My name is Nanakwa Jordan. The segment was brought to you by Vodafone Power to you and Fan Max Fuel Your Day. Alfred and Natalie standing yeah. by. Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, my name is Alfred Okanse. On behalf of the rest of the team, we're grateful that you spent some time with us. Absolutely. And I'm Natalie Fourth. Visit our website, 3news.com, for some more news. Remember, news at 10 late this evening. We'll sign our cast last distance station. That's 3FM 92.7. Thanks so much for watching. Have a remarkable evening.